weekend, every weekend. Now a hearing on government finances. The House Subcommittee on Government Management is exploring the results of a government-wide audit of the federal agencies and departments. Subcommittee Chairman Steve Horn issued his annual report card on the financial health of the government. It lasts about two hours. Quorum being present, the Subcommittee on Government Management Information Technology will come to order. Last year, the nation's first ever government-wide audit provided a comprehensive accounting of a multitude of financial problems with the executive branch of the federal government. I'm disheartened to report that the results of fiscal year 1998 audits are equally dismal. Once again, billions of taxpayers' dollars were lost to waste, fraud, and mismanagement or just can't be accounted for. This audit is required by the Government Management Reform Act of 1994, a bipartisan law in the 103rd Congress. The law specified that no later than March 31st of 1998, and each year thereafter, the Secretary of the Treasury, in coordination with the Director of the President's Office of Management and Budget, shall annually prepare and submit to the President and Congress an audited financial statement for the preceding fiscal year. The audited financial statement should cover all accounts and associated activities of the executive branch of the federal government. The required audit conducted by the legislative branch's general accounting office is being released today. The audit report shows that the federal government is unable to report accurately to the taxpayers or to Congress how it spent more than $1.8 trillion in fiscal year 1998. The audit report also shows that federal agencies were unable to safeguard an account for $1.6 trillion in government assets. And estimates of future costs are off by billions of dollars. Also today, we're issuing our second report card summarizing the results of the 1998 audit reports on the 24 largest federal agencies. As you can see from the grades, there has been very little improvement. In fact, some agencies have taken a step backward. Of the 17 agencies that submitted the required report, five received Fs, six received Ds. Only two agencies, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration and the National Science Foundation earned A's. Perhaps some of those distinguished scientists could be loaned out to help unscramble the tangled financial web which seems to plague a few other agencies. The grades provide a summary status of these agencies that have been submitted their report. But as of yesterday, seven of the 24 agencies still had not submitted reports, even though it is one full month after the legal filing date and six full months after the end of the fiscal year. You will notice that these agencies, which include the Departments of Commerce, Education, Interior, State, and Transportation, received Fs on their report card. It is troubling to this subcommittee that we're unable to provide this report in a timely way. Both the General Accounting Office audit report and the individual agency reports weave a woeful tale of poor financial management practices within the federal government and the financial risks created by those weaknesses. We must pay close attention to the details of these reports because of their wide-ranging effects. This report is our second warning. Next year, there must be significant improvement. I thank our distinguished witnesses for being here today to discuss the results of this comprehensive and important effort. We're delighted to have the new Controller General of the United States, Mr. David Walker, who is in charge of the General Accounting Office. It is Mr. Walker's first time before this subcommittee, and we welcome him. Accompany him is Assistant Controller General Gene Dodaro. Also before us are a number of other key witnesses from the Office of Management and Budget and the Department of the Treasury. The Honorable G. Edward DeSiv, Deputy Director for Management, Office of Management and Budget. Uh, we wish him well as he moves to the private sector. This is his last day technically on the job for the executive branch. He's done a fine job in a very difficult circumstances. He's accompanied by Ms. Deidre A. Lee, the Administrator, Office of Federal Procurement Policy, Office of Management and Budget. 
And uh, the other key witness is Dr. Donald V. Hammond, the Fiscal Assistant Secretary of the Department of the Treasury. I now yield to the ranking Democrat, Mr. Turner of Texas, who will have some opening comments, and then to the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Davis. Mr. Turner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The second audit of the federal government's books submitted to us today reflects a significant effort by the administration and the General Accounting Office. And I want to commend the people who are responsible for this second timely audit. It would not have been possible without the dedication and hard work of a number of employees at the General Accounting Office, the Department of the Treasury, and the Office of Management and Budget. American taxpayers deserve to know when, where, and how their tax dollars are being spent. The President and the National Performance Review under Vice President Gore embraced this principle early in their first term. And in September of 1993, the National Performance Review recommended the preparation of an annual consolidated financial report and the establishment of comprehensive government-wide accounting standards. These recommendations became law as a part of the Government Management Reform Act of 1994, passed by the Congress, signed by the President. Government financial audits highlight a number of serious financial management concerns and show the extent to which certain federal agencies have experienced difficulty in keeping track of their property and equipment which is significant because without maintaining reliable inventories, it's impossible for agencies to make new purchases and to purchases of supplies in a cost-effective manner. As we have heard prior to today's testimony, the Department of Defense, the Department of Agriculture, and the Department of Transportation have experienced similar property and equipment accounting problems. Another area of concern that has been revealed deals with the various agencies' abilities to gain a clear picture of the scope of their respective liabilities. Without a clear understanding of the scope of liabilities, agencies cannot adequately minimize costs to the taxpayer. For instance, the Department of Defense and Energy have experienced difficulty in estimating among their overall potential liabilities the respective environmental liabilities. Additionally, some of the largest credit agencies, such as the Department of Agriculture and Veterans Affairs, still lack historical data on their credit programs, which is required by the Federal Credit Reform Act of 1990 and by federal accounting standards since fiscal year 92. Simply put, these audits impose new financial discipline on federal agencies and provide new information relating to the cost of federal programs. For these reasons, there should be bipartisan support for this audit effort and for the improved financial management that they have rendered. I notice that the majority staff has assigned uh, grades to these various audits, and I notice there are a lot of Ds and Fs on the report. And I might offer a, a word of caution because it's my opinion, Mr. Chairman, that the letter grades may be an oversimplified reflection of what is actually happening uh, in these various audits. Uh, clearly. Uh, there has been improvement in the audit practices and performance of these agencies in the last three years that we have mandated these audits to be performed. Uh, agencies are showing definite improvement in audit results. Only one of the 24 major agencies had reliable financial statements, which we call a clean or unqualified opinion, uh, in 1993. However, by fiscal year 97, 11 agencies received clean opinions. And this year, uh, the Office of Management and Budget anticipates that 13 agencies will receive clean opinions. Overall, we, have, we clearly have witnessed steady progress from our federal agencies and improved audit results. I have a chart that I think illustrates uh, this very clearly, which shows the uh, results uh, the other chart, which shows the results of the audits for the past uh, several years. And you will note on there that there has been uh, steady progress. Uh, in 93, as I said, only one agency received a clean audit. By 96, we had six. By 97, we had 11. And in 98, uh, 13. 
So I'm pleased to see progress. That does not indicate that there's not yet much work to be done. But I do want to underscore that uh, 11. the results of grading the agencies may not fairly reflect that there has been significant progress. I also uh, found it interesting the uh, minority staff, Mr. Chairman, took the majority staff's uh, grading approach and applied it to, to the Congress. And I have another chart that shows that. So we didn't even uh, if we looked at the Congress itself and applied the same standards that the uh, grading system applies to our 24 federal agencies, we'd see that the Congress, measured by the three standards uh, of the grading system, would result in the Congress itself receiving a D minus. And I know the chairman is very much aware, as I am, that the Congress has made significant progress in the last several years in its auditing uh, uh, results. So uh, while there is much work yet to be done, uh, we should at least acknowledge, I think, the fact that there has been progress made, and we hope that progress uh, will continue. Uh, clearly, um, we need to eliminate some of the obstacles that we'll hear about today that would result in a clean opinion. And I hope uh, all of us share, as I know the chairman does, uh, the importance of the auditing work that is ongoing and the importance of approaching it in a bipartisan way. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman and appreciate his comments. I would merely say with reference to Congress, after 210 years, uh, the first audit in the history of the Congress over two centuries was the one that uh, the <laughs> speaker commissioned when we uh, took over in 1995. And every member was sent a complete audit of the Congress for the first time in history. I now yield to the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Davis. Thank you. And I don't know whether to thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm not sure whether to argue if the glass is half full or half empty. Uh, I count from the material given to us, we have eight agencies that are in compliance. We have a number of incompletes. Uh, the ones that I have for the record in compliance are NASA, uh, National Science Foundation, GSA, Labor, um, the Social Security Administration, FEMA, HUD, and uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Uh, we have others that are qualified, and we have, have had no reports yet from Commerce, Education, EPA, Interior, Small Business Administration, State, and DOT. Uh, hopefully some of these will bring it into compliance, but that's eight. But even if you had 13 clean, apparent, clean opinions, that would mean 11 are not clean opinions after several years of working at this. And I'll tell you this, if these were my kids and their report card, uh, they would be grounded and uh, they would be uh, getting some tutorial to try to bring them up to snuff, even though the progress may be slightly in the, in the positive uh, direction. Also, if this was a taxpayer uh, and they submitted records like this, uh, it would be referred to the, the U.S. Attorney's Office. So this is just unacceptable in many of these cases with what is coming forward. Uh, let me just say, I look forward to the testimony today. And for Ed DeSev, I think this will be his last testimony before an agency. Ed, uh, good luck in the private sector. I've enjoyed working with you uh, on a number of projects. And I think I can safely say uh, for all of us that you've left this city a lot better than you found it. And when you leave government, that's, that's as good as it gets, I think. Uh, <laughs> and uh, you have D. Lee with you. Of course, we've worked on a number of projects. And my neighbor, uh, Don Hammond, so I can't beat up on you. Uh, too much, but uh, uh, we really appreciate the efforts that you have made. You have made a huge difference for the District of Columbia and the federal government, and you will you'll be missed in public service. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman very much. Uh, we will now start uh, with the Controller General, and uh, we welcome you. And uh, since we're an investigating committee, all the subcommittees of government reform uh, have all witnesses sworn in. So, Controller General, Mr. Dare, if you'll rise. Raise your right hand. You soundly swear the testimony you're about to give this subcommittee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Clerk will note both witnesses have affirmed the oath, and uh, your statement is automatically put in the record as the other witnesses' statement once we introduce you. And please feel free to proceed, whether you want to summarize it, whether you want to read it. I've read it all, and uh, it is a very thoughtful statement, as we would expect, and uh, we would welcome your comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's a pleasure to be here today. And I will uh, summarize my statement uh, since the entire statement has been put into the record. Uh, I might note that, uh, Mr. Chairman, that you obviously don't grade on a curve uh, and that it's, it's, it's my understanding that, uh, that if GAO had been applied to your ratings that we might have gotten an A. At least that's my understanding. But uh, 
And I think it's important that we lead by example because, after all, we are the agency that are overseeing others, and I think it's important for us to do that. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I'm pleased to be here today to discuss our report on the U.S. government's financial statements for fiscal year 1998 and to underscore the importance of continuously improving how federal departments and agencies manage the finances of our national government. The federal government has underway the implementation of important legislative reforms to promote greater accountability in managing the finances of our national government. Timely, accurate, and useful information has not been available across government to assure financial accountability and to help continuously improve the economy, efficiency, and effectiveness of our government. It is essential to improve how federal departments and agencies manage the finances in order to achieve better accountability at the federal government level. Fortunately, the President and OMB have taken financial management in general and the annual audit in particular very seriously, and they've made it a priority. As a result, considerable e effort is being made by agencies to achieve the mandate of achieving a cle clean opinion uh, and eliminating material control weaknesses from their uh, financial reporting. And steady improvements on financial accountability are incurring. However, several major agencies are not yet able to produce auditable financial statements on a consistent basis and they have major obstacles to overcome. Similar challenges exist in producing reliable statements for the entire U.S. government. The historic long-standing inattention to financial management issues in the government, combined with the size and complexity of government operations, make corrective act actions difficult but imperative. Moreover, the pace of improvement will be greatly influenced by the progress government organizations are able to make in, first, modernizing their information systems and internal controls. Secondly, revamping their human capital practices to enhance capacity. And thirdly, implementing change management strategies to achieve the discipline needed to follow sound financial management and reporting practices. I might add a fourth, Mr. Chairman, and that is it's absolutely critical that there be sustained attention and commitment at the very top of all the departments and agencies, as well as at the President OMB, in order to get this job done and to make continuous improvement. The executive branch recognizes the extent and severity of existing deficiencies and that addressing them will continue to require concerted improvement efforts across government. With concerted effort, the federal government can continually to make progress towards achieving accountability and generating reliable financial and management information on a regular basis. It's critically important, Mr. Chairman, that we have this information on a regular basis, not just at year end, and I'll come back to that later. The balance of my remarks, Mr. Chairman, will be focused on several points. First, outlining the findings of our report on the financial statements of the U.S. government for fiscal year 1998, underscoring the critical need to fully implement legislative reforms, emphasizing that unqualified or so-called clean opinions must be accompanied by timely and reliable data, stronger controls, and better financial and management information systems that will help to continuously improve the economy, efficiency, and effectiveness of government. Stated differently, receiving a clean, clean audit opinion is not an end in and of itself. It is an important and objective milestone which we must strive for. However, we need to make sure that we have the systems and controls in place in order to assure timely, accurate, useful information to make informed decisions to improve the economy, efficiency, and effectiveness of government on an ongoing basis. I'd like to highlight the fact that human capital must, absolutely must, become a more critical part of the management reform agenda in order to achieve the objectives of the Results Act and to move towards a more performance-based government, and urge that the focus be on the term accountability, not accounting. We're called the General Accounting Office but we're about accountability. And financial management is one element of accountability, but there are others that are important as well. With regard to the results, Mr. Chairman, of our 1998 fiscal year audit, last year the GAO reported in the first ever report on the U.S. government's financial statements that because of serious deficiencies in the government systems, record keeping, documentation, financial reporting and controls, 
amounts reported in the financial statements and related notes do not provide a reliable source of information for decision making by the government or the public. These deficiencies also affect the reliability of the financial statements and the government's ability to measure the full cost and financial performance of programs and to manage related operations. Our report on the U.S. government's financial statements for fiscal year 1998, which is being released today, has reached the same conclusion. Specifically, due to these deficiencies, we are unable to express an opinion on the financial statements of the U.S. government. Major challenges include the federal government's inability to properly account for and report billions of dollars of property, equipment, materials and supplies, and certain stewardship assets. To properly estimate the cost of most major federal credit programs and the related loans receivable and loan guarantee amounts. To estimate and reliably report material amounts of environmental and disposal liabilities and related costs. To determine the proper amount of various reported liabilities, including post-retirement health benefits for military employees, accounts payable, and other liabilities. To accurately report major por portions of the net cost of government operations. To determine the full extent of improper payments that occur in major programs and that are estimated to involve billions of dollars annually. And to ensure that all disbursements are properly recorded and to properly repair, prepare the federal government's financial statements, including balancing the statements, accounting for billions of dollars of transactions between governmental ent entities, in other words, intra-governmental transactions between one department and another, and properly and consistently compile the information to present consolidated financial statements. Overall, we found significant financial systems weaknesses, problems with fundamental record keeping, and financial reporting, incomplete documentation, and weak internal controls, including computer controls. These deficiencies continue to prevent the government from accurately reporting a significant portion of its assets, liabilities, and costs, and affect the reliability of the financial statements and the government's ability to accurately measure the full cost and financial performance of programs and to manage its operations. Mr. Chairman, you noted earlier uh, the current status of individual agency audit efforts. Uh, and uh, Ranking Member T Turner also noted that there has been progress made over the last several years, but we've still got a ways to go. I think it's important to note that uh, there are a number of agencies that still have not completed their required audits, and yet we are a number of months past the fiscal year end. This in and of itself, I think, serves to demonstrate the challenges and the complexities that these agencies face uh, and, and the underlying uh, issues associated with the lack of adequate management information systems to prepare, prepare timely, accurate, and useful information uh, for the audit, much less for day-to-day -day decision making in ongoing operations. Producing audited financial statements on time by the March 1 statutory deadline is still a challenge, but improvements were made this year by certain agencies, in particular Health and Human Services. In addition, uh, some agencies for the first time uh, have received clean audit opinions or unqualified audit opinions. I might note housing and urban development, it's my understanding, has received a clean opinion. We have designated as high risk certain agencies with the most serious challenges, DOD, IRS, the Forest Service, and the FAA. All, however, have efforts underway to address these deficiencies. Importantly, the Customs Service was removed from our high risk list due to their concerted efforts and demonstrated progress in achieving positive results. Audited financial statements are essential to providing an annual public scorecard on accountability. However, an unqualified or clean audit opinion, while certainly being important and an objective milestone, is not an end in and of itself. For some agencies, the preparation of financial statements requires considerable reliance on ad hoc programming and analysis of data produced by inadequate systems that are not integrated or reconciled and offer require significant audit adjustments. Some agencies undertake heroic efforts to obtain reliable year-end data that can be audited. But these efforts are not backed up by fundamental improvements in the underlying financial and information management systems and control mechanisms to support ongoing program management and accountability. 
As a result, these heroic efforts will not achieve the intended results of the CFO Act over the long term. Namely, the CFO Act is, is intended to enhance overall accountability and assure that the financial and management information systems and controls are in place to continuously improve the economy, efficiency, and effectiveness of government. To do so, systems must provide timely, accurate, and useful information for informed decision making. Improving financial and management information systems is essential. For fiscal 1997, agency financial auditors reported that 20 of 24 major agencies' financial systems did not comply with the Act's requirements. Similar results are expected for fiscal year 1998. In addition, agencies face the year 2000 computing challenge of assuring that their systems can function properly as we change to the new millennium. This task is, is appropriately taking priority and will temporarily sidetrack agencies from much needed other improvements in their systems. Strengthening computer controls is vital as well. We continue to find serious and widespread computer security weaknesses that place enormous amounts of federal assets at risk of fraud and abuse, financial information at risk of unauthorized modification or destruction, sensitive information at risk of inappropriate disclosure, and critical operations at risk of disruption. The GAO, as you know, Mr. Chairman, has done a tremendous amount of work in working with the Congress to provide leadership, along with working with the administration, on the Y2K effort. It is very clear that computer security will be fast on its heels once we get past the new millennium. Human capital, Mr. Chairman, an integral part of financial and management information reform, and indeed any management initiative, is acquiring, developing, and retaining the human capital needed to achieve results. Enlightened leaders understand that effectively managing employees, otherwise known as human capital, is essential to maximizing the performance of any organization's effectiveness. Only when the right employees with the right skills are on board and are provided with the training, tools, structure, incentives, and accountability to work effectively is organizational success possible. As it relates specifically to financial management, the CFO Act recognized the importance of leadership in creating CFO positions throughout government and in establishing a goal of improving the qualifications of financial management personnel throughout government. While some attention to delineating critical core competencies, needed skills, and appropriate training has occurred in the government, a great deal more needs to be done. We plan to give greater attention to recommending the ways that the government can improve the strategic approaches to human capital planning, the acquisition and development of staff with skills to meet critical needs, and the creation of performance-oriented organizational cu cultures while protecting reasonable merit principles. Without a firm foundation of reliable and timely, accurate and useful financial and management information, the many reforms underway across government to move to a performance-based focus will never be successfully fulfilled. Only then can the government assure adequate accountability to taxpayers, manage for results, and help decision makers make timely and well-informed judgments. Experimentation is now underway across government to develop single accountability reports on individual departments and agencies. These reports will consolidate and integrate audit, audited financial statements and reporting under the Results Act and other related laws to show the degree to which an agency meets goals, at what cost, and will aid the reader in determining whether the agency is well run. I might note that the Social Security Administration is leading the way uh, in this effort and should be commended for it. Reliable accountability reports that include information on the full cost and results of carrying out federal activities will help to correct the problem of a lack of complete and reliable information that has been a source of concern for congressional and agency decision makers for decades, and it will greatly aid decision making for our national government. Reliable financial information also is essential for analyzing the government's financial condition and helping inform the budget deliberation, deliberations by providing additional information beyond that provided in the budget. In closing, Mr. Chairman, I would like to commend you and the subcommittee for its diligent oversight and actions to improve financial and ma management of our federal government. Your hearings have helped to underscore the critical importance of the issue and to make progress at a more rapid pace. 
I look forward to working with you and the other <coughs> members of this subcommittee as we strive to en enhance accountability and to continuously improve the economy, the efficiency, and the effectiveness of the federal government. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, we thank you for that uh, very fine statement. Uh, what we're going to do now is alternate between members here of five minutes each. And as chairman, I will uh, yield my first five minutes to the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Davis. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Walker, you, you, you talked about um, uh, that a clean audit opinion, while certainly important and almost a starting point, is not an end in itself. Could you just briefly elaborate on that? Obviously, a clean audit opinion or an unqualified opinion is something that is generally recognized uh, and is something that is an objective measure, and it is one that uh, we should strive for and ultimately should hope to achieve clean audit opinions on all agencies and departments as well as at the overall Federal Government level. At the same point in time, it is possible to achieve a clean or unqualified audit opinion and still have fundamental problems with regard to the financial and management information systems and have material control weaknesses that puts the agency at sub subject to potential fraud, waste, abuse and mismanagement. Uh, as a result, while we want to get the clean audit opinion, we want to make sure that structural improvements are made, too, uh, as, at the same time. Without a clean audit opinion, though, it is much more difficult to get at the core issues, isn't it? I would say that, uh, that one of the benefits of striving for a clean audit opinion is it forces you to focus on these underlying issues. Mm -hmm. However, it is possible and, in fact, it has already occurred, as evidenced by the summary sheet. There are agencies that have clean audit opinions uh, that haven't dealt with the underlying problems and need to deal with the underlying problems because it is possible through heroic efforts to do a tremendous amount of work as of the beginning of the year and the end of the year to get a clean audit opinion, but yet you don't have the systems to make ongoing management decisions. Now, to make the government-wide financial statements balance, Treasury recorded a net $24 billion item which it labeled um, unreconciled transactions. Um, if this number is a net number, what is the gross number or real amount of the difference? We can't tell you that, Congressman. Uh, if, we could, if we knew what the gross number was, I think we would be able to uh, make more progress in allocating it properly. Uh, that's the net number, and it's one of the reasons that we can't express an opinion. But it could literally... Gene? We, yeah. we, we do know, for example, Mr. Uh, Davis, that in just the intergovernmental accounts or transactions that occurred, there, there alone there was a net difference of about $250 billion. So there, we don't know exactly what the total gross differences are, but there are a number of problems that occur. One is the fact that Treasury records do not agree with the agency records in all cases, and there is a lot of unreconciled transactions, and uh, that's number one. Number two are these intergovernmental transactions. The government does a tremendous amount of business with itself and agencies cannot eliminate those when it comes to the Treasury level. Treasury has difficulty uh, reconciling those. So the amounts that are out of balance also include adjustments to the agency statements that come in. It's not yet clear that the data that are on these agency individual statements is the same data that Treasury is using to roll into the government-wide statements. Uh, progress has been made this past year in uh, providing greater certification that that has happened. But that is why the compilation process of compiling these statements is still a problem. Now, if a taxpayer sent this kind of form up to the IRS, what would be the reaction, you think? It would probably be less lenient, the IRS would be. Than, <laughs> at the same point in time, I think that one has to recognize It could that well spark an investigation if you sent these kind of records up, wouldn't it, if you were a normal taxpayer, corporate business? I, I, couldn't, I couldn't tell you that, Congressman, but, but I will tell you this. You don't, think it, you don't think it would? You think they'd say this is fine? It doesn't, oh, the numbers I, I don't add up? I would say it was fine. I would say they would be very concerned about it. There's no question about it. I think we have to keep in mind that... Well, very concerned, man. It could, it could in fact, uh, be, be a referral, couldn't it? It could. Yeah, okay. Uh, I think we have to keep in mind that unlike the private sector where audits have been in existence for decades, uh, and even, frankly, in the state and local government sector where audits have been in existence for a couple of decades, uh, the Federal Government, rightly or wrongly, uh, is uh, a laggard in this regard. We're a fairly new player to this. 
Uh, and I think the fact of the matter is, is that we should have had better financial and management information systems all along, but the fact that we're now having this audit demonstrates a lot of the challenges that existed before that had not been brought to light. Now, I understand that the Department of Defense Inspector General reported that the defense made over a $1.5 trillion in adjustments to its financial records in an attempt to prepare financial statements. Is that possible? Is that, is that number it, accurate? That's correct. My understanding that's correct. What does this tell us about the state of confusion over there? I would say that the Defense Department probably rec uh, represents the single largest challenge in the, in the area of financial management, probably rep represents also... It's probably half the spending of all the agencies, right? Half of the discretionary. It's half of discretionary, right. I think. Over, uh, you know, as you know, mandatory keeps going up every year. Mandatory is about 70 percent now of the federal budget. Right. Uh, it's a major challenge, and it's not only a challenge with regard to financial management, Congressman, it's also a challenge with regard to uh, virtually other, every other area of management, strategic planning, human capital, uh, information technology, et cetera. Let me ask just one last question. Um, you talked about, you know, human capital effectively managing employees and the challenge in an information age. There's a worldwide and certainly a national and regional shortage of finding qualified people to do things. And this is, we see this every day in the, in the, in the private sector where they're bidding up people. And of course, in, in private companies, you have stock options and a whole host of what we call golden handcuffs to hold on to people and retain them. The government doesn't have that available. Current government compensation levels adequate to attract key managers in these areas? Or is that just something maybe you're not, you haven't focused no. on? I was in charge of Arthur Anderson's global human capital practice, so uh, compensation is something I know a little bit about. Right. Obviously, the federal government is not and never will be competitive with the private sector with regard to compensation. Uh, we rely to a great extent on getting individuals who are dedicated to public service to come here. There are, however, real serious issues that we need to look at uh, in the compensation area in the federal government, especially for certain critical skills uh, where there's a tremendous imbalance. Uh, I think there is a need for comprehensive, frankly, human capital reform in the federal government, and compensation is one of the areas we need to look at. Well, let me just, Mr. Chairman, I just note that I, I agree with that. We had FEPCA a few years ago, the Federal Employees Pay Comparability Act, and every year the administration has come in well under the numbers that would have been uh, recommended in keeping that up. But it seems in some of these very critical areas, we're losing people in procurement, we're losing people in key management positions where they can walk across the street and get significantly more money, compensation, a career path that the federal government today uh, just doesn't offer the same kind of opportunities. And maybe we're asking our agencies to do things that, you know, under the current compensation formulas are very, very difficult to do. So I just leave that parting uh, thought with you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I uh, completely agree with the gentleman from Virginia, and uh, we're delighted to have a number of dedicated public servants before us today, both in the, you in the legislative branch and uh, those that are to come in the executive branch. Now yield five minutes to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Turner. One of the things that I would like for you to explain to kind of put everything in context. I, I know when you do these audits and you come up with uh, less than perfect opinions, that it could mean that there was just lack of documentation and evidence, you know, furnished by the respective agency. Or it could be that there's something there that would show us there's, that there's some fraud or waste or abuse. Um, could you give me an example of something that's found in these audits that would clearly show us that there's fraud or waste or abuse in that agency as compared to something that's found that we really don't know until we look deeper? I'll start and then ask Mr. Dodaro if he wants to add. I think the absence of effective internal controls uh, is where you have material control weaknesses over disbursements, for example, uh, or represents an area where you clearly have an opportunity for waste, fraud, abuse, or mismanagement. Uh, one area where progress has been made in this regard is with regard to Medicare. 
Uh, in Medicare, they, were, they have made estimates for the last several years as to what is the estimated amount of improper payments. Now, there's a lot of reasons you can end up getting an improper payment. Part of this was because of the focus that was placed on this issue as a result of the audit of, uh, of HICFA and HHS. That number, fortunately, has come down from about $20 billion a couple of years ago to this year, I think it's about $12 billion, $12.6 billion. So they're making progress. Uh, but a lot of the reasons that those things are possible is because of the lack of adequate internal controls. Uh, but again, one of the benefits of this audit is that they're now focused on it and they're trying to make progress. Gene? I think uh, the area of improper payments that the Comptroller General was just uh, noting is probably one of the most vivid examples where the financial audits have served to quantify how much money is going out of those programs that should not be. The area of Medicare is a clear example, and the reason that it's not is from inadvertent error to, to fraud and abuse. And we know in the Medicare area there's a significant amount of fraud and abuse of that system. Uh, other areas have been rent subsidies for the uh, Housing and Urban Development Program, the Social Sec uh, Supplemental Security, Social Security Program, the SSI Program. They've been able to quantify overpayments, so that's been very effective. Also in the computer security area, we know, for example, the SSA IG uh, found uh, employees really stealing identity fraud that led to the creation of false uh, Social Security forms and, and uh, subsequent uh, issues. We also know at DOD they're subject and f have found in a number of cases some embezzlements that have occurred over there. The other area is in safeguarding the assets. The federal government has a tremendous amount of inventory and property, and sometimes those assets are not properly safeguarded and could be subject uh, to theft or unnecessary deterioration. So it's a combination. We certainly have those items that you mentioned. There's an awful lot of documentation that then is not there that leaves a lot of questions unresolved. So it's a combination of both issues. Uh, Mr. Walker, are you satisfied that once these audits are done, that the agencies actually take the results of them seriously and begin to try to resolve the problems that the audits reveal? It's clear to me that by the President uh, making financial management a priority uh, and setting goals for having clean audit opinions for all of the agencies as well as the federal government, and with OMB's follow-up, that they're taking it a lot more seriously today than they were several years ago. Uh, progress is being made uh, at the same point in time we've got a ways to go. Uh, and one of the challenges we face is the fact that we have new reporting standards and new accounting standards that come out that these agencies have to deal with. And some have a difficult time being able to deal with that because of some of the inherent weaknesses in their, you know, financial and information systems. One of the things that disturbs me the most um, about uh, the results that we're looking at today is the seven agencies that have failed to complete their audit by the March 1st deadline. Uh, and I might, uh, I guess I could reserve this question also for Mr. DeSilve, but I would like to know why these agencies did not meet the statutory deadline. I think it's best to direct that question to uh, Mr. DeSev. At the same point in time, I think uh, it's my understanding that uh, several of these agencies had difficulty in dealing with some of the new, uh, new standards and the new reporting requirements that were effective for this year. That could be one of the reasons, but I would suggest you ask him about that. Uh, I think it is a problem, however, that here we are uh, March 31st, and year-end was September 30, uh, and we're one month past the deadline for when the agencies were supposed to pr present their audited financial statements, and they still haven't done it. That just, that shouldn't happen. If that was the case in the private sector, you'd have serious problems with getting credit, and, and uh, your stock price would probably be adversely affected. Well, I look forward to hearing those explanations. Obviously, some of the reasons may be understandable, but uh, when we talk about one significant portion of this audit is to determine whether the agency has complied with the federal law. If that was the case in the private sector, 
you'd have serious problems with getting credit and, and uh, your stock price would probably be adversely affected. Well, I look forward to hearing those explanations. Obviously, some of the reasons may be understandable, but uh, when we talk about one s significant portion of this audit is to determine whether the agency has complied with the federal laws and regulations, obviously one of them is this deadline of March 1st to complete this audit. And I would hope the agencies would take that seriously. Uh, one other uh, question that I would have for you. Uh, when we look at the uh, intergovernmental transfer issue, which you threw out a big number a moment ago, I think it would be helpful if you just explain to us what an intergovernmental transfer is. Give us an example of one. And then from that example, explain how uh, that cannot be properly accounted for and, and why we have that kind of problem. Yeah, uh, a good example, uh, for example, would be the Internal Revenue Service uh, purchases a lot of goods from the government printing office to, for the tax forms that are sent to the public. And uh, IRS uh, records may indicate a, uh, uh, an amount that they owe the government printing office. Uh, part of the problem is rooted in the fact that years ago agencies were having difficulty with one another uh, actually uh, recouping the amounts that were owed them. So the Treasury set up a process, and, and Mr. Hammond can explain this because they're trying to, to fix this right now, uh, where in this case GPO could go to Treasury and say the IRS owes us a certain amount of money for these tax forms that we've printed and mailed directly to the public and postage, uh, et cetera and take the money out of IRS's account at the Treasury, because the Treasury maintains fund balances. Agencies do not have, by and large, uh, cash accounts where they write checks. They, it's all done through central banking function, uh, pretty much uh, by and large, except for some defense activities. Uh, and in this case, the IRS uh, accounting records may show a different uh, payable that would show it be different than what would be on GPO's books. So when those records then go up to the Treasury Department. They're unable to reconcile. On one hand, the IRS would show a payable to GPO. GPO's records might show uh, not a compensating uh, uh, payable, and then you wouldn't be able to eliminate that. And those type of transactions go on all across the government. Uh, for example, the Social Security Administration really performs a lot of services for HICFA in the Medicare. Uh, area and actually issuing Medicare cards and then Social Security uh, charges HICFA and then HICFA uh, uh, basically uh, then pays them. Uh, you have situations where the General Services Administration operates a lot of government buildings and actually charges the agency's rent. So the uh, rent that is on the GSA books might not necessarily correlate to the amounts that the agencies say that they owe GSA. A lot of agencies buy equipment from the federal prison uh, system that, that's made through the process. It, it just goes on and on and on throughout the government. And there's uh, estimates of several hundred billions of dollars of, of buying and, and selling that goes on among the agencies. And right now there's not an identification uh, in the systems, and this goes back to a systems problems, that would allow Treasury to properly consolidate that the way you would in the private sector, if you had a uh, large holding company with several subsidiaries, you need to be able to consolidate that. Thank you, Chair. I thank the gentleman. Uh, let me uh, ask a few more questions, and then we'll go to our next witnesses. I believe, can you stay with us, Controller General? Yes, we can, Mr. Chair. Okay. Uh, let me just uh, get into the trust funds for a minute. Uh, the Controller General in the, your General Accounting Office report states that the trust fund investments and liabilities, which amounted to $1.8 trillion as of September 30th, 1998, are netted out to zero in the statements. Could you explain to me what that means and what's the significance of those amounts being, in essence, eliminated? Basically, it, it represents a practice that is consistent with what would happen in the private sector because, in effect, what you have with the trust funds is under current law, to the extent that there are, let's take Social Security, to the extent that you end up having excess receipts over disbursements in a given year, by law, the excess must be invested in U.S. government securities. Uh, that obviously represents an obligation of the U.S. government. So what you have is you have a situation where on one hand you have a budget account known as the trust fund 
uh, that has obligations to the U.S. government. That's a receivable. On the other hand, you have the U.S. government, the operating entity, that owes money to the trust fund, uh, which is a liability uh, to that or, or a commitment to that trust fund. Intra-governmental intra transactions get eliminated in consolidated financial statements. Uh, and so as a result, the only debt that you have in these consolidated financial statements are debt held by the public, uh, which is third-party debt, if you will. One point I'd like to make on this, Mr. Chairman, if I can, is our report was issued today and also yesterday the trustees' report for Social Security and Medicare was released. Uh, one of the, some of the information that I think is important that it received more prominent disclosure in the annual consolidated financial statement audit is stewardship information with regard to Social Security and Medicare. The fact is the information that we have in the 1998 audit is based on last year's trustees report because this had not been released and yet they're coming out one day apart. I think one of the things that really needs to be considered as to whether or not the consolidated financial statement audit might come possibly a couple of weeks later such that significant information like this could be incorporated into the consolidated financial statements. And so we don't end up confusing the public by, in a matter of days, being talking different numbers or different dates on programs as important as Social Security and Medicare. Having heard your answer to that, I guess I'd ask this. Uh, does it provide us with the proof when you take a look at the federal government as a whole, that's the consolidated uh, financial statement, uh, that indeed there's no money set aside to pay for those future costs of programs supported by those trust funds? How does that work? Basically, under current law, the trust funds are invested in government securities. Those government securities are, are uh, backed by the full faith and credit of the United States government. They're guaranteed as to principal interest. But in effect, what they represent, they represent a first call on general revenues in the future. They do not represent what you and I would normally refer to as a normal trust fund that is a separate and distinct legal entity with hard assets in it that are invested in, in the markets that uh, are subject to fiduciary responsibilities. So their claim on future general revenues. One of the things that concerns me when we went over the Internal Revenue Service uh, financing and computer operations, the money that comes in from FICA and Social Security, Medicare, is sort of just dumped in a general pot. Uh, it doesn't come in and go to a FICA trust account, Social Security, uh, Medicare, whatever it is. It simply goes into the nearest bank designated by the Department of the Treasury. And uh, there's a group in the IRS, sort of an uh, office of estimates, where they somehow just speculate as to what amount of that money really ought to go into the Social Security trust fund, in quotes, because there really isn't much of a trust fund, or into Medicare, in quotes. And I just wonder what you, as a new Controller General, uh, think you ought to look at this, of how they do it, and why can't they just say if there's a check from the employer, uh, let's take Social Security, where the employer is responsible for half the payments, the employee is responsible for half the payments. The employer is really taking both those payments of the 15 percent and sending a check for maybe times two employees, maybe times 2,000 or 200,000 to the Internal Revenue Service. And yet we really don't, aren't sure that every check that said, well, this is my FICA contribution on the quarterly reports, uh, we don't uh, know if it's ever in the right uh, place. Well, there are some challenges here, Mr. Chairman, that I think uh, both the executive branch and we need to keep our eye on. For one thing, uh, the information that is reported as far as revenues that are received, uh, as you properly point out, are really handled by the Treasury IRS. Uh, the amounts that are, that are used by Social Security for the purposes of benefit payments are different, and therefore there can be circumstances in which individuals are getting paid for benefits that the government never ever collected the taxes. This is one of the areas that we pointed out in our report that needs to be focused on to a greater extent. I would ask Gene. Yeah. Uh, the issue of allocation to the trust fund is one that we focused a lot on in doing the audit of consolidated statements, and we've been working with other auditors. It is a fairly complicated process 
Uh, and part of the reason that there are estimates and allocations made uh, emanates from the fact that the IRS believes it would create an undue ta uh, burden on taxpayers to have them identify all the different types of taxes uh, at the time the taxes are deposited. And right now, the, ba the only basic separation are, are among income and payroll taxes because they're withheld at source by and large and are deposited uh, by uh, companies into uh, financial institutions and then flow to Treasury. So there's a category they check. We send in you know, $100 uh, million this month. Uh, of the $100 million, uh, $70 million of it was for income uh, taxes that we withheld for individuals. Uh, as well as Social Security withholdings and Medicare withholdings, and $30 billion was for excise taxes that, uh, you know, that, that we owe. And then that, because that money is not identified at that point in time, the only information comes in when the tax return is filed by that company, and then IRS uses that information on these tax returns from the companies to then allocate out and to go back and double-check the estimates and how much is apportioned to the trust funds and make any sort of adjustments at the end of the year. Uh, as you point out, the adjustments are, are given to by the Office of Tax Assessment at the Treasury Department. They give the amount of allocations on how to distribute the revenues to the Treasury Financial Management Service, and then they make the allocations to the trust funds during the year in terms of the appropriate securities that should be credited to those trust funds. Uh, and then uh, the excise tax funds. Now, the excise taxes are a little bit different since they're supposed to be allocated based on collections rather than the assessments. We've pointed that out as a problem in the past, uh, and the uh, IRS has come up with a new approach on how to handle that. But we uh, strive to look at from the inception of the revenue coming to the government, how it's allocated through this process to the individual trust funds, uh, and to make sure they're properly credited. So we're trying to cover that. And every year we get a little bit uh, better at making sure we have the total picture covered. But that's one area we think is very important, Mr. Chairman, and we've been focusing a lot of attention on that. Well, what you're saying is of the 15 major trust funds, you'd like to see all of them in a real, true trust fund relationship where money is earmarked if it's to go into the trust fund and you don't have an office of estimates on this or tax assessments? We, we think with modern uh, computer systems now and that it would be very beneficial to have in electronic form, if most taxpayers could submit it, a breakout of the specific taxes at the time those taxes are actually, the money is deposited by the organizations into the Treasury accounts. We've pointed that out in every audit we've done of the IRS. We uh, have uh, uh, had this uh, area on the radar screen with them for a while now. Unfortunately, they've been sidetracked by, because of their preparations for the year 2000 problem. They've also had, as you know, some major systems failures over the past few years. Uh, Treasury has a new electronic tax deposit system now that has a lot greater capability, and we plan to work with Treasury to try to identify a way to do this that doesn't impose any undue burden on the taxpayers. Uh, but that is the only way to really make sure that you track it as it's being deposited into the Treasury account, and then it could uh, flow through the process without an estimation approach. What would be the impact on uh, the presidents, regardless of party? We know that presidents have dipped into the general revenue of the Treasury, a lot of which was being sent to be in Social Security or Medicare or whatever. Uh, what would be the economic impact and the political impact uh, if what you say and what a lot of us up here say, we ought to isolate these funds so they're clearly set aside and we can say to the American people on the unfunded liabilities that we have the proper amount in there to cover the unfunded liabilities. Is there any danger in that in terms of uh, future presidents, current presidents? Doesn't matter what party they're in, they've all dipped into the Treasury funds in that extent to show that we have less of a deficit, shall we say. And if we isolated that off, would that be part of the uh, national debt uh, deficit, or would it uh, just be on its own and sitting out there, be invested, obviously? But Mr. Chairman, there's a difference, obviously, between the economic, the investment, and right. the accounting aspects of this issue. It's a very, very complicated issue. I mean, 
you know, we have stated uh, on the record that we believe that reducing, from an economic standpoint, that reducing debt held by the public uh, is a good thing to do uh, because of the fact that it ends up uh, helping build future economic capacity. Uh, we've also uh, stated uh, that, uh, you know, obviously, with regard to Social Security, a lot of the current unified budget surplus, in fact, all of it this year, is coming from Social Security. Uh, I think there, it's a separate issue as to what the investment policy ought to be, but the fact of the matter is the only type of debt that's going to be appearing on the consolidated financial statements of the U.S. government under current accounting principles is debt held by the public. We do, however, believe that it's important to disclose and to have more prominent disclosure in the consolidated financial statements of the federal government information with regard to Social Security and Medicare because, after all, every American cares about those programs. Uh, and this audit report is not just for the Congress and not just for the federal government. It's for the American people, too. I now yield uh, five minutes to the gentleman from Texas, and after that we will call up the Treasury witness and the OMB witnesses, and then you will be sitting with them, and we can, in my case, get back to more questions for everybody at, at that. Gentleman from Texas. Mr. Turner, I'll yield back my time. I, I don't believe I have any further questions. Okay. Mr. Turner uh, is going to yield his time until a future occasion after the Treasury and OMB have testified, so if we can have those witnesses come forward. Uh, the Honorable G. Edward DeSiv, the Deputy Director for Management, Office of Management and Budget, accompanied by uh, Administrator Deidre A. Lee, Head of the Office of Federal Procurement Policy, Office of Management and Budget, and Mr. Donald V. Hammond, Fiscal Assistant Secretary of the Department of the Treasury. Everybody's found their uh, seat there. Raise your right hand. Do you affirm that the testimony you're about to give to the subcommittee is the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? I do. I do. The clerk will note that all three witnesses have affirmed the oath. And uh, we'll uh, begin with the uh, distinguished gentleman who's l this is the last day of uh, government service for this round. And Mr. DeSiv, we're glad to have you here, and we wish you well. Uh, you've done a fine job for the administration and for the people, so uh, uh, we hope uh, you will do as very fine a job in the private sector. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee. I'm here today to discuss the progress made during the last year in financial management, particularly as reflected in the financial report of the United States government. But I'm also here to describe the challenges that still face us. In his transmittal of the audit report, um, of the Audit of the Financial Report, Comptroller David Walker said, these financial reporting requirements are prompting steady improvements in financial accountability. There's been good progress toward meeting legislative objectives. At the same time, major departments are not yet able to produce auditable financial statements. The requirement for a government-wide financial report began with fiscal year 1997, and a similar requirement extended coverage of the Chief Financial Officers Act to all major agencies. That was contained in the Government Management Reform Act. Chart 1 shows the progress under these statutes over the last six years. It's very similar to the chart that Mr. Turner showed you earlier, uh, not quite as colorful as his chart. In addition, uh, the GAO report – actually, I want to do – want to stop for a second and congratulate the Department of Housing and Urban Development, uh, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, and the National Science Foundation, who for the first time received uh, unqualified opinions on their financial statements. In addition, the GAO report of the financial report of the United States government for fiscal year 98 stated that action is now underway across the government to address pervasive, generally longstanding problems discussed in this report. Chart 2, got my chart man here, chart 2 depicts our expectations. Mr. Turner asked, uh, what progress do you expect to continue? What you see is what we anticipate for 1998. The blanks are disclaimers or qualified opinions. What we see in 1999 is that we expect 20 of 24 and then finally 23 of 24 in, in the year 2000. Um, the lone exception there will be the Defense Department which does not expect a clean opinion at this point until beyond the year 2000. 
While agencies have made substantial progress, challenges remain. Recognizing these challenges, President Clinton issued a memorandum to all agency heads on May 26, 1998, directing agencies to develop corrective action plans for addressing these challenges and submit quarterly reports of progress. Agencies submitted these plans and reports to OMB, and they formed the basis for discussion between senior agency officials, including the inspectors general, and senior executives from OMB, Treasury, and GAO on the process the agencies were employing to meet clan goals and their progress for success. The team's assessment is that while the challenges facing certain agencies are daunting, the commitment of the agencies is reassuring. Chart three, please. I'd like to show you these challenges by functional area and by department for those agencies that do not have clean opinions. The departmental challenge is primarily in the Department of Defense with the Department of Agriculture and a couple of others having some challenges. But the functional area that faces us with the most difficult problems is the one that we talked about earlier, uh, intra-governmental payments. The Defense Department is taking significant steps to deal with its problem. The Department believes that the lasting effective solutions to producing reliable financial information requires a Department-wide information overhaul. They have embarked on such an effort. Over the last few years, the Department has streamlined its nu numerous incompatible finance and accounting systems by eliminating over 200 systems that did not collect information needed to comply with current accounting standards. More recently, the Department has been developing a blueprint for financial management reform and in the fall re re released the first comprehensive financial management improvement plan. We and GAO, Treasury, the Department's Inspector General have worked with them to review and refine that plan. IRS revenue collection and public debt receive clean opinions is my next headline. In addition to the progress previously referred to in terms of the number of unqualified agency financial statements, for fiscal year 1998, the GAO reported on the results of the audits in the Internal Revenue Service and the Bureau of Public Debt. The Internal Revenue Service's statement of custodial activities, which the chairman referred to earlier, received an unqualified opinion. The schedule of public debt reflected a similar unqualified opinion. The amount of money that the IRS covered was about $1.8 trillion and over $5.5 trillion of public debt was similarly included. GAO also points out, in addition to the qualification on opinions, a series of areas that re need ongoing attention. These are the management internal control weaknesses that the Controller General talked about earlier. The administration for the past several years has been putting out a report on priority management objectives. I'd like to get the next chart, please. These priority management objectives are chosen, as the President said in his budget, to reflect, quote, areas in need of real change that will receive ongoing attention for the administration. We didn't put them out, these out in response to last year's report or the year before his report. We put them out because they're things that the administration wants to get done. You can see that heading the list is managing the year 2000 problem, followed closely by improving the results orientation of program management. That's GPRA. And next, audited financial statements, uh, improving financial management information. These are things that we're formally committed to. We manage with a monthly planning process the response to these. I don't need to tell you, Mr. Chairman, where we are in Y2K. We last night gave you the results um, of the uh, flash reports from the precincts, the flash reports from the agencies that show that more than 92 percent of the financial systems are compliant. We expect that the committee will want a full review of that and will be happy to provide that information as it comes in. We agree with the Controller General that protecting critical infrastructure and particularly computer security is the next Y2K challenge. In fact, we're using the techniques that we developed in Y2K to begin that process. Uh, the President issued uh, PDD 63 last year, developed, uh, requiring agencies to prepare plans and requiring a national plan for computer security to be prepared. Sector groups going out into the private sector, led by federal agencies, just as we're doing in Y2K, will be mobilized in the computer security area. Another area that the Controller General pointed out in his report is better managing financial portfolios. We agree that loan portfolios in particular need to have improved management. Working with this committee, the Debt Collection Improvement Act has given us some new tools, and my, my formal statement gives you the uh, ways that we're implementing those tools. Next, verifying that the right person is getting the right benefit. We uh, also agree with the Controller General that for fiscal year 97, we had a 14 percent error rate in the Medicare program. Unacceptable. 
totally unacceptable. The current error rate of about 7 percent is similarly unacceptable, but it's half the previous rate, and that's because we've been trying to manage to that problem that was identified through auditing. Throughout the government, there are a series of cross-cutting groups that are working together to set standards, the Federal, Standard, Federal Accounting Standards Advisory Board, the Joint Financial Management Improvement Project, and the Chief Financial Officers Council, as well as the Chief Information Officers Council, are bringing agencies together to prepare standards that give us the ability to tackle some of the challenges that don't exist just in one agency. One agency doesn't have an intragovernmental payment problem. At le it takes at least two to have such a problem. In summary, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to again quote the Controller General by saying, quote, the executive branch recognizes the extent and severity of the financial management deficiencies and that addressing them will require concerted improvements across government. The administration has set goals for individual agencies as well as government as a whole to complete timely audits and receive unqualified opinions. With concerted effort, still quoting, the federal government as a whole can continue to make progress toward generating reliable information on a regular basis, unquote. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, the administration has demonstrated from the President on down that it recognizes the need for continued concerted action to continue to make progress. Given where we were in 1993 and the obstacles we faced, the progress we have made to date is extraordinary. Notwithstanding the formidable nature of the remaining challenges, we've set a high bar for ourselves and will redouble our efforts to improve the reliability of financial information provided by agencies and the government. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we thank you, and uh, we now uh, go to Mr. Hammond, the Fiscal Assistant Secretary of the Department of the Treasury. You're a career uh, member, as I recall. Is that correct? That is correct, Mr. Chairman. How many years have you had with the Treasury? Uh, Fifteen. Well, you're going on 30 then, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. We're that's off a, to a that's good a great start position. Least, yeah. I, I knew Bill Parsons, who was about 30 years ahead of you and one of the great fiscal assistant secretaries and management secretaries down there. So welcome. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, I appreciate the opportunity to appear today to discuss matters involving the second annual financial report of the U.S. government. First, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the Chairman, the Ranking Member, and other members of the subcommittee for your continued support and encouragement to improve financial accountability and reporting in the Federal Government. Last year was the first year in its history in which the Government prepared comprehensive financial statements covering all of its diverse activities. While a great deal of work has been done and progress made over the last year, there are still significant challenges and obstacles that must be overcome to enhance and improve the reliability of the accrual-based financial information presented for the U.S. government. The Government Management Reform Act of 1994 requires that not later than March 31st of each year, the Secretary of the Treasury, in coordination with the Director of the Office of Management and Budget, shall prepare and submit to the President and the Congress audited financial statements for the preceding fiscal year covering all of the accounts and associated activities of the executive branch. This is the second time such audited financial statements have been prepared on a government-wide basis. The financial report of the U.S. government for FY98 provides the President, the Congress, and the American people with information about the government's assets and liabilities, its costs of operations, and its sources of financing. The financial report is prepared on the accrual basis of accounting as prescribed by federal accounting standards. These differ from the cash basis of accounting used in the preparation and reporting of budget results. Each method is a useful tool in its own right for looking at the government's operations for different purposes. Since the passage of the GMRA, we have been working very closely in cooperation with OMB, GAO, and the federal program agencies to create the standards and systems necessary to create and implement an entirely new system of identifying and tracking all the operations of the United States government. This past year, we focused much of our attention on three important areas. First, increasing the consistency of information reported to us by program agencies. Second, identifying and reducing inaccurate eliminations of intragovernmental transactions. And third, assisting agencies in reconciling their fund balances with Treasury records. I will briefly summarize our efforts in each of these three areas. It is essential 
that the information used by Treasury to prepare the government-wide statements be consistent with the information contained in the respective agency-level financial statements. The agency-level financial statements are separately audited, and the audit of the government-wide financial statements relies heavily on those audits. Consistency problems need to be addressed by the agencies working in very close cooperation with OMB, Treasury, and the GAO. This past year, Treasury initiated actions to provide agencies with ongoing support, guidance, and training. We issued written guidance to program agencies in an effort to improve consistency. Treasury has also conducted both formal and informal training with agencies directed at the specific consistency problems associated with their respective financial systems. As a result of our close work with the agencies this year, we achieved a 20 percent increase in our consistent reporting. 25 of the 32 entities so reported this year. We will continue to work with the program agencies on this important issue, and based on our experiences this past year, we are very optimistic the future reporting will improve. Both last year's and this year's audits of the federal government's financial statements disclose that Treasury did not effectively eliminate transactions between agencies for government-wide reporting. If these transactions are not properly eliminated, total government assets, liabilities, revenues, and expenses will be misstated by the amount of those transactions. Treasury, OMB, and GAO have been actively working together in a government-wide task force to find methods and solutions for the elimination problem. The task force has looked for solutions that not only help the agencies identify and reconcile transactions among themselves, but also improvements to the Treasury's process of creating the government-wide financial statements. After careful analysis, the task force identified several detailed categories which can be summarized in two broad categories of intergovernmental transactions, investment and loan transactions, and all other activity between the agencies. During FY98, we focused most of our attention on resolving the intergovernmental issues for investment and loan transactions. These investment and loan transactions are primarily the types of transactions discussed earlier occurring between the trust funds and various government agencies, and at least at one end point involve the Treasury Department. They involve trillions of dollars on an annual basis. In December, Treasury, after consultation with the agencies, issued elimination guidance for the preparation of the FY98 statements. As a result of these efforts, significant progress, as detailed in my written statement, was made in FY98 in reconciling these intergovernmental investment and loan transactions. We plan to make even more progress in FY99. In addition, to assist the agencies with other transactions, Treasury provided two-digit identification codes, the use of which is absolutely critical to the ability to eliminate and reconcile this purchase and sale and other activity between the agencies. In FY98, 24 of the 32 agencies required to use these partner codes were able to identify 80 percent or more of the dollar value of their transactions. That's good progress. We're not there yet, and we need to do considerably more to deal with this issue. The third issue has to do with our activity reconciling fund balances. Since Treasury acts as the banker for the government, as agencies request payments to be made or receive funding, their account balance with the Treasury will change. This fund balance amount is an agency-level asset account that reflects the agencies available budget spending authority. Both the agency and Treasury independently track the account balance. Treasury notifies agencies of discrepancies in their fund balances as compared to our records, and agencies are then responsible for resolving these differences. We have made significant efforts to assist agencies in reconciling their fund balance amounts with the amounts reported by us, including surveys of their information needs, the issuance of standard operating procedures, training, improved communication between us and the agencies, and the provision of technical assistance. 
we are expecting continued and significant improvements in agencies' abilities to reconcile fund balances again for this year. However, we are facing many challenges as we go forward. As Secretary Rubin stated, and I quote, a great deal of work has been done, but the development of this new method of reporting is an immense task, and a great deal of additional effort will be necessary to create and implement an entirely new system of reporting on the operations of the U.S. government. We at Treasury are committed to this effort, and we have both short-term and long-term actions underway to address them. In the short term, we will continue to make those changes necessary to continue to improve the preparation of the financial report. In the long term, we are embarking on a project to make fundamental changes in the way we do business. Our most significant short-term challenges are in three specific areas. First, we need to continue to make substantial progress in eliminating intergovernmental transactions. Second, additional improvements are needed to make data reported to Treasury for the financial report consistent with the agency's audited financial statements. And third, we need to enhance the process of identifying the data needed to do a complete reconciliation of the budget results reported on the cash basis with the financial statements results of operations. Regarding the elimination of intergovernmental transactions, Treasury intends to put in place additional procedures and processes to ensure that progress in eliminating transactions in the investment and loan category continue. But most of our efforts this year will be spent working with OMB and the program agencies to identify and put in place processes to affect the other types of tra intergovernmental transactions. We feel confident that by continuing our focus on attention in these areas, we can again make more progress. With respect to ensuring consistency of reporting, this year's report or this year's process has identified areas where we can continue to improve and make reporting less burdensome on the government agencies. We have also identified several problems agencies had in verifying their financial statements with the detailed information sent to us. These problems relate to the need for additional information, formatting issues, and the reporting of changes in opening balances. Building from this base, we will take further steps to again show improvements in consistency next year. Finally, regarding reconciliation of the budget results with the financial statements results of operations, a team of Treasury staff with assistance from private contractors will develop the necessary information requirements and procedures to accomplish this reconciliation. Our plans are to ask for the necessary information in next year's report process, and our goal is to make significant strides in identifying all the information necessary to complete such a reconciliation next year. While making short-term changes to improve the financial statements process is important, we have also committed and recently initiated a major project to fundamentally rethink and redesign our central accounting system and processes. We will be working with OMB, GAO, the program agencies, and the Federal Reserve System in developing new processes that will provide more timely, accurate, accessible accounting information, follow established accounting standards, and support the control of resources and management decision making. Goals of the new processes include reducing the reporting and reconciliation burden on program agencies. We also intend to develop processes that maximize data accuracy at the time of collection and capture information once at the earliest time possible to meet multiple recording, reporting requirements. Improving financial management and accountability is a Treasury priority. We have taken and will continue to take actions to correct weaknesses and problems in the preparation of our government-wide financial statements. We are working hard to resolve these problems, but much work remains to be done. Treasury will also continue its leadership role in providing guidance, assistance, and support to the agencies in their ongoing efforts to improve their accounting practices and financial management systems.
Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. That concludes my remarks this morning. Uh, we thank you, and we'd now like the Controller General, Mr. Walker, and the Assistant Controller General uh, to come forward, join the panel, and uh, we'll have the concluding questions over the next 20 minutes. Uh, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Turner, will begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Siv, you heard me earlier ask the question about the seven uh, federal agencies that failed to meet uh, the March 1st deadline for submitting their audited financial statements. Could you give us the reasons those seven agencies have failed to do so? Yes, sir. I, th I think I can. Let me uh, first describe the process that we, JO and the Treasury, use throughout the year. We uh, meet with the agencies, their inspectors general and their um, financial staffs in their agencies and spend a considerable amount of time talking with them about the very specific problems that they're having. And then uh, literally weekly and uh, sometimes daily we talk to them about what the status of their uh, audit reports are. We're finding two major problems this year. One is a new set of auditing standards and financial statements that agencies did not have to deal with before, particularly the statement of budgetary results. It's a new one and it's giving some of them problems. And as a result, whenever you have a problem in this circumstance, you'll have an independent auditor, sometimes an outside auditor, and an inspector general and the financial folks who together have to agree that the information that's put together is in fact correct. Getting agreement on these new statements is, is a great deal of a uh, big challenge for some. Of the seven, we expect that five will have clean opinions, and that relates to the second issue. Some of them are the heroic efforts that the Controller General talked about, where they're in the midst of doing special studies on things like loan portfolios that have taken them beyond the deadline. Uh, we expect them to be clean, but not timely. And we, like you, share the desire to have them be both clean and timely, and we've been encouraging them in that direction. So it's not a lack of uh, sensitivity to meeting the March 1st deadline, and you feel every agency is working diligently to be yes, sure sir, they get it, the Yes, sir. It's not unwillingness. Done. It's inability in this case. One of the things that Mr. Hammond mentioned in his written statement, uh, you, were, you were referring to the progress uh, that the Treasury has made in reconciling intra-governmental investment and loan transactions. I was noticing in your written statement you said uh, with regard to that, specifically for investments and federal debt securities, the difference last year was $3.1 billion. The difference this year was $3.9 million. For interest receivable and interest payable, the difference last year was $3.2 billion. The difference this year was $855 million. For interest revenue and interest expense, the difference last year was $8.5 billion. The difference this year was $214 million. And for loan receivables and amounts due to the Treasury, the difference last year was $7 billion. The difference this year, $353 million. Now, that seems to be significant progress. Uh, what accounts for the dramatic reduction, and do you feel you're going to even move beyond the progress you've made? Yeah, we do feel that that's significant progress, but obviously those numbers need to come down to zero. Um, what accounts for that progress this year are two things. First, we learned a lot from last year's process and were able to build in enhancements in this year's process that allowed us to plan for those types of transactions. We focused a lot of time and attention on the investment and loan accounts. In addition, Treasury has the advantage at being at one end of pretty much every one of those transactions. As a result, because of the clean opinion we received on the statement of the public debt, we have great confidence in the numbers that we produce and are therefore able to go back and work with the individual agencies, note differences, and be able to work to resolve them. The progress you see there really reflects that quote, close cooperation with the agencies who, have, who hold the trust funds for their program needs and to be able to walk through the appropriate transactions. The differences that remain typically result from timing differences on the behalf of the agencies as well as circumstances where they may be doing certain technical adjustments to interest accounts, such as accruing interest receivables or amortizing discount and premium over different periods or using different accounting methods. We need to get a consistency of approach between the agencies, and we think those numbers will then go to zero. You know, it's really hard to imagine what it 
must have been like before the Chief Financial Officers Act was passed in 1990 and the Government Management Reform Act passed in 94, uh, because prior to that we wouldn't even be here having this discussion today. Um, and I want to commend the Chairman on his diligence in making sure that both of those pieces of notable legislation are working uh, by continuing to hold the agencies accountable for the implementation of both of those federal statutes. Uh, one of the things that struck me uh, about your testimony, Mr. Hammond, was your reference to uh, the goals that the Treasury has for reducing the reporting and reconciliation burden on agencies. Uh, it seems to me that with these new laws and requirements for reporting, there are probably uh, many a chief financial officer uh, who is feeling a tremendous burden of all of the various reporting that takes place. And it would be helpful, I think, to give us an example of uh, some of the burden you're talking about and, and what you're thinking about doing that would reduce uh, the burden of all of these multitude of activities that they're charged with performing. I'd be happy to. I, I think that is, a, in fact, a very significant area of stress for a number of agencies on all the various reporting requirements. And as we look at the compilation of the government-wide financial statements, fundamentally what we've done is we've tried to accomplish the production of these statements by using information that comes from systems that weren't designed to produce the information needed for an accrual-based financial report. The result is, is that we ask agencies to take budget information, present it to us in a different format, and then provide it to us in a way that then has to be reconciled back to the information they're using to present their own financial statements, as well as the information that they're doing for their budgetary reporting. Given the short-term horizon and the need to produce these statements, it is the best we can do in the short term and we continue to work around the edges to enhance that. But fundamentally, the systems needed to supply information to produce these systems shouldn't be the type of situation where you have system A coming in, system B coming in, system C, and creating the need for all these reconciliations as you move along. They should, in fact, come from a common source of information and then simply present that same information in different formats. That, in essence, is the principal goal, or one of the principal goals, of our longer-term effort to redesign the central accounting system. Mr. Turner, may I add to that and make a small commercial here? Uh, the Controller General earlier referred to accountability reports, and the Social Security Administration, the Veterans Administration, and others have produced those. Those are an attempt to consolidate information from GPRA, FFMIA, FMFIA, we we'll get to get you here. The uh, GMRA, the CFO Act, and even some other statutes. So potentially the uh, the uh, G, the uh, IG statutes into a single location in a readable form, so people can actually use them as a corporate annual report is used. Right now, there are pilots under the Government Management Reform Act for accountability reports. We would like to work with the committee to propose extending those pilots. And I always hate to use the word mandatory, but uh, encouraging agencies, if not making those kinds of reports mandatory for agencies, because we think it will give them the ability to have a single report that contains lots of different information. I would think we could even add some Clinger Cohen information to it uh, as well. Thank you. Thank Mr. You. Chairman, we, we've, supported, yes, we've supported these uh, pilot projects, and we believe that the idea of expanded accountability reports where you end up getting valuable information on a consolidated basis in plain English with charts and graphs uh, is a good idea. Thank you. Uh, I want to pick up on that, uh, Controller General, on page 10 of your statement. You refer to the Brown Act, uh, which is Senator Brown from Colorado, now retired and uh, really knew a lot about this type of audit and accounting. Uh, and that's the Federal Financial Management Improvement Act of uh, 1996. And then uh, you also uh, note uh, the difference in conformity here between 97 and 98, and that similar results are expected for fiscal year 98. Uh, I would just ask this question. Uh, is some of the problems with these agencies that they don't have a full-time chief financial officer 
that either the assistant secretary for management or somebody else there has said, I'm the chief financial officer. That bothers me. I know what people that work in OMB and your job, Mr. Hammond, these are 18 hour a day jobs, often seven days a week. And it just seems to me when they bury the CFO under mm -hmm. some of these uh, other agency rubrics like assistant secretary for management, I realize they might not want to give up all that power they have as assistant secretary for management, but somebody's got to focus strictly on the financial aspects. And that's why Congress put into the law chief financial officer with a direct reporting relationship to the appropriate executive, uh, either the deputy secretary or the secretary. And I just wonder what your thinking is. Well, I think there's little question that given the challenges that, that we face in the financial management area, and given the fact that the objective is not just to get a clean opinion, but to have underlying financial management information systems that will be continuously improved to uh, improve economy efficiency and effectiveness, that the CFO for any major department or agency is a full-time job. Uh, I, might, I might ask if Ed Does has any OMB comments. Does OMB want to comment on that? We'd be delighted to, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, we've seen different organizational structures in different agencies. The Justice Department has the Assistant Secretary for Management structure. The Department of Housing and Urban Development has the standalone CFO structure. Uh, the statute permits either, as you know, as long as the reporting relationship is clear. Um, I think the decision made by the agency to give the appropriate amount of responsibility is even more important. We strongly support budget authority in the hands of the CFO. There are still at least one agency, and there may be two, uh, where budget authority is not in the hands of the CFO. And we've been very active in trying to move them in that direction. We also find, though, that the role of the career deputy CFO is terribly important. When we in the CFO Council merged the two groups, the group of deputies and the CFOs, into a single body, it became much more apparent to us that that career deputy, in many cases, was the go-to guy, uh, go-to gal in lots of places, uh, where we had career CFOs who would come and go over a two- or three-year period. They were the continuity. So it's the strength of the organization up and down the organization. Um, my own personal preference would be, in most cases, in most departments, to see a single, a single purpose CFO in those departments. It's always been my preference. Um, and that person should be at least at the assistant secretary level. There may be some departments where the undersecretary level could be an appropriate uh, uh, locus for the CFO organization. Yeah, I'm, I'm certainly not against a deputy CFO, and it ought to be a career person without question. But I would certainly think any of these that can't file on time and get it wrong when they do file, it seems to me OMB ought to say, hey, folks, enough is enough. We want a strong CFO in that agency, and we want to see a different result next year. Now, you're not going to be here next year. <laughs> you, might be, you might be on contract, but uh, Mr. Chairman, I've been have working, you in as a yeah. contractor. I've been working in-house and out-house for uh, many years. And, uh, I, I don't want to follow up on the in-house and the out-house. <laughs> <laughs> you win. And that. I realize we're on, we're on TV, so I have to be, we both have to be yeah. circumspective about that. Uh, but I think uh, the desire that I have and the administration has is that the chief financial officer responsibilities are well done in each agency. And we've tried to make that case uh, time and time again to some of the agencies. Yeah. Controller General. Mr. Chairman, I think the other thing that has to be emphasized as well, in addition to the importance of uh, the CFO, there has to be an active partnership between the CFOs and the CIOs uh, in this regard, because what we're looking to is to move towards integrated systems that will provide, you know, key financial and other management information. Uh, and that's a big job, too, the CIO job. And eventually we're going to have to end up looking to something else, uh, and that's uh, CHCO, Chief Human Capital Officer because that's the most valuable asset we have, and we don't pay, some, pay enough attention to it. Let me move to one that everybody has mentioned at one time or another, and uh, that's the computer security control weaknesses that have been found and reported across the government. And there's various instances where auditors were able to gain unauthorized access or penetrate the systems. Uh, these weaknesses affect the integrity and reliability of the government's financial and programmatic information. And I guess I would ask all of you, how pervasive are these weaknesses? And uh, just are you able to penetrate a lot of these systems? And what are the agencies and OMB needing to do to correct these weaknesses? 
Mr. DeSive. I think the statutory framework that we have at this point is, is probably a pretty good one. Um, I'm satisfied that um, from the Computer Security Act of 87 to the Paperwork Reduction Act of 95 and on to Klinger Cohen, we have the laws in place. What we've had to do is, number one, increase awareness within the departments and agencies, especially when they were overtaken with the idea of Y2K. Y2K in some ways is a computer security problem. It's a problem we created for ourselves. It's not an external problem. The Defense Department, working with the rest of the intelligence community, has engaged, and Gene can tell you more about this than I can in some ways, has engaged in a very major review um, of the external threats to the federal government from cyber terrorism. And we'd be happy to get you a briefing on cyber terrorism. It's very real. It's something we uh, are very concerned about. And with the National Security Agency and DOD, they've been building a set of scanning systems and deflection systems. Much of that information is classified, but again, we'd be happy to get your briefing on it. The more General, you want to comment on that? No, go ahead. Mr. Chairman, we're doing a lot of work in this area uh, because obviously there's many aspects that are troubling here when you deal with computer security. It's not just getting accurate, timely, and useful financial information. It's also issues that deal with uh, national security, defense, as well as economic security, as well as personal privacy. Uh, we've spent a fair amount of time in this area already. We anticipate that this area will be our number one area of focus in the information management area after we get past Y2K. Uh, Gene might have some comments on anything in specific that uh, he might think might be appropriate here. I think uh, basically this is a, a serious pervasive problem across government. It's been, and not only in government, uh, across as we have computer systems that are more integrated, more accessible. We've seen examples in, in just the last day or two of how vulnerable computer systems are through the introduction of some of these viruses. There are two types of problems. One is vulnerability to people outside the agencies being able to, to uh, hack into the systems. And there are vulnerabilities there. There are also vulnerabilities of authorized users within the systems that have too much access. And both problems are plaguing the federal government. We raised this as a high-risk area across the government in February 1997. As uh, uh, Mr. Zsev pointed out, on October of that year, the President's Commission on Critical Infrastru Infrastructure Protection said this is not only a problem for the federal government, it's a problem across all sectors. They've taken some initiatives to do this. We suggested the CIOs put computer security as a priority. They've done that. Uh, GAO's gone out and studied best practices in the private sector. We've issued those. The CIO councils endorsed those best practices and are in pr process of putting them in place. We think each agency needs a comprehensive risk assessment process and follow-up process. And also, there needs to be coordinated efforts at the government-wide level of OMB, the National Security Council, and others. And we've made those recommendations. They're beginning to do that, but there's a long way to go. Uh, I do think there's a need to re-examine the uh, basic uh, statutory framework and the Computer Security Act was issued in 1987. Uh, it's been a long time since that's been looked at. We're in a process of thinking about ways to strengthen those uh, requirements. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yield to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Turner. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I will have only a brief uh, remark. I just really think it would be appropriate for us to acknowledge the good work that Mr. DeSive has given to the administration. Uh, since the inception of this administration in his role at the Office of Management and Budget. Uh, his service to the administration has been commendable, and his willingness to endure the vigorous oversight of this Congress also is to be commended. Uh, we wish you well in your transition to the private sector, and we appreciate uh, the contributions that you have made uh, to us all. Thank you, Mr. I, I know Chairman. that there are many people probably listening today who are in the same position I'm in. I'm beginning to start my work, fill out my tax return. And I had it all spread out on the kitchen table the other night. And you know the way it always is. You, you uh, always find something you know you've got to go retrieve before you can actually do it. So I'm at that stage now. And I, there's one question that was on my mind as I began my tax return preparation. 
and I know it's going to be on the minds of a lot of uh, taxpayers. And I'm sure, Mr. DeSiv, you can answer this question as one of your final responses to this committee. I noted that this year I have to make out my check to pay my taxes to the United States Treasury instead of the Internal Revenue Service. And I wish you would explain to us why we're changing who we pay our taxes to and uh, perhaps that will relieve the minds of a lot of us taxpayers. I'm really going to let Mr. Hammond from the Treasury <laughs> handle, handle the question. I think uh, the vigorous oversight of this committee has uh, talked to Commissioner Rosati and other folks in the IRS about the major restructuring that's going on there. And I think that we'll see over the next several years uh, perhaps not a kinder, gentler IRS, but one that is more customer-oriented and one that understands better how to deal in an electronic age with taxpayers where they live and in the kinds of organizations in which they find themselves. Uh, but, Don, I'm going to kick the uh, question on IRS versus the U.S. Treasury okay. to somebody from the Treasury. You're sending the check to Mr. Hammond, is what you're doing. <laughs> Hopefully not personally. Not well, personally. Yeah. Of course not. Of course is not. your fax machine going to be jammed? That's right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, I, I think there are two reasons, actually. One is, is that the payee information of U.S. Treasury better indicates that the taxpayer is, in fact, not supporting the operations of the Internal Revenue Service by their payment, but is in fact making a tax payment on behalf of the entire government. Uh, in addition, I think that it also helps deal with some of the characterizations um, when the Internal Revenue Service lent itself in some cases to people putting IRS on check payee information, which in some cases I believe was eligible to be forged or manipulated. And so I think there's also a corrective, a corrective action attached to this. Yeah, Mr. Turner, I might add that in our audits of IRS, as you've heard, this committee's heard, uh, that last point that Mr. Hammond raised is a valid one. A lot of people would change IRS, even though the instructions would say Internal Revenue Service to spell it out. If you put IRS in there, they change the I to an M, misses, and then put a period and put a name on. And that, that issue has been a problem. Uh, in the past with people uh, uh, basically uh, taking some of those checks and falsifying them. Uh, so we were pleased to see that change. Well, I, I thought somebody was going to tell me that we had eliminated an intra-governmental <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the few where everything's working well. Yeah, right. what, what I think I learned is that we're just paying our taxes to a friendlier payee. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. It doesn't change, though. Yeah. Right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's been a pleasure to uh, have all of our witnesses before us today. Well, I agree with you on that, and I must say I've suggested this in the past, but I don't get too many followings in the House on this, and that is all members of Congress should sit in the House of Representatives on April 15th with no tax advisors and make out their own form, 1040, and file that one with a check. And I think we'd reform the tax laws so fast we wouldn't know what hit us. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we're all getting a little comfortable with the Be Beardsley Rummel great idea of withholding at source, which uh, if we had to pay one big check at the end of the year with no withholding, that too would create a tax revolution. But apparently those ideas aren't acceptable to a majority here. And uh, let me just uh, mention a few uh, comments that I want to uh, get out of you and thoughts. Uh, one of our problems in these uh, various uh, financial statements that are before us involve the nuclear cleanup liability. Uh, and, uh, Controller General, in your testimony, you say the executive branch has significantly underestimated the future costs that will be needed to clean up environmental contamination and the disposal of hazardous waste. Uh, what's the amount that uh, GAO, General Accounting Office, has picked on this particular area? Tens of billions, exactly. Mr. Chairman, it, it's difficult for us to estimate what the exact amount is. That's one of the reasons that this is a problem area, but we know that it's in the tens of billions of dollars range. Uh, would it be more than a hundred billion? Because we're talking nuclear reactor waste, Could we're be. talking nuclear submarines being chopped up and uh, their waste. And uh, as I understand it, a lot of this occurs in the state of Washington. And uh, we know nationwide we have this in the non-governmental sector, hospitals, nuclear waste piled up uh, waiting for disposal. Probably not that. 
it, it could be, but it's probably not because there have been increases that have that have occurred over the last several years to increase the estimate uh, of that liability. And I think, as you know, Mr. Chairman, uh, it, there's a range of issues here. It's not only with regard to the defense industry and, for example, the decommissioning of nuclear subs, uh, but it's also in the uh, uh, the utility and the energy field with regard to nuclear power plants. It's a very serious issue, uh, especially in light of uh, base closings and other things where you have things that aren't nuclear, that there can be environmental issues associated with that as well that aren't nuclear related. Well, I think we have the problem throughout the executive branch. One, the Department of Defense has a, a strong program, we thought, in terms of uh, the cleaning up the environment on bases that have been closed. But I must say, I don't see much action in that area, and I think there should be a lot more. And uh, we also uh, have the problems uh, in other agencies on their own assets, that they really can't account for them and put a dollar figure on them, which is very hard. If you're in the National Park Service, what's the dollar figure on Yellowstone? It's priceless. You don't uh, have 100,000 or 100 million. It wouldn't uh, be relevant. How are we going to handle objects like that? Well, I think that's why we have to look at what's meaningful financial information to the Congress, to the President, to the American public. Uh, and to the extent that it provides meaningful financial information, then we ought to dollarize it. To the extent that it really doesn't, and it's really more of a stewardship responsibility, and there ne needs to be accountability, but not necessarily uh, the, the numbers don't necessarily mean anything, then I think we need to take that in mind. Uh, we have to keep in mind what the purpose of these financial statements are and who the users are when we're thinking about things like heritage assets, you know, monuments, national parks, even weapons systems. Uh, what, what's, it's appropriate to have some accountability for the cost of those weapons systems, but how significant is to know what the discounted uh, amortized cost of a B-2 bomber is. Uh, what are you going to be able to do with it? I doubt, I doubt that we're going to uh, have an alternative use for it. Of all the agencies that the General Accounting Office looked at, uh, which agencies have the worst inventory records on their supplies and all the rest? DOD. And that's known as the Department of Defense. That's correct, the Defense and, Department. And they tell us they're low on munitions. So do, do they just not have a system that tells us where they are in warehouses all over the world or what? They have real challenges with regard to the inventory area. I, our report, our high-risk report noted, I think there was about uh, 22 billion. Is that correct? Is that the number I recall? Yeah, no. It was about $22 billion worth of inventory items that they may have. They just don't know where it is. Uh, now, obviously, that creates difficulty in trying to decide how to utilize it when you need it, whether or not you ought to order any, order any additional materials to replace it, uh, how you can effectively secure it, how you, uh, you know, a range of issues. And, and a lot of this is, is normal inventory items rather than major weapon systems. But let me take the department's part on this uh, in two ways. One, the departments had systems for logistics and inventory that were controlled at various levels. They weren't necessarily centralized, and they didn't talk to their financial systems. Why? We never asked them to. We've never asked these questions before. So the department feels that it has good controls, not perfect controls, but good controls over its inventory and over its property. It's never had to do valuation before. The challenge of valuing Yellowstone is similar to the challenge of valuing Fort Ord or valuing some of the other properties that the department operates. So the, the valuation challenge remains, and they're in the process of solving that problem. But I think we have to be careful not to mix apples and oranges here in the sense of a field commander knowing where his inventory is, being able to get a logistics system to get him that information or get him that material quickly is one test. Having that under control, under good asset control, having a central agency or a subordinate, a, 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 a superior officer on being able to see several uh, inventories is also very important. Um, but the department, I think, would tell you that they believe they have adequate controls in lots of different places. GAO would suggest the controls could be better. The efficiency of the department and its effectiveness would be improved by having better visibility of these assets. And I agree with both things. Mr. Chairman, if I can yes. add on that, I think DOD, the Department of Defense, is a good example. As I look at government, there's two 
dimensions of government. There's the business of government and there's the mission of government. Missions vary depending upon what department you're dealing with, an agency you're dealing with. But, but all aspects of government need to run from an economical and an efficient basis. If you look at DOD from an effectiveness standpoint, some of the logistical issues that Ed's talking about, they're clearly an A on effectiveness. We're number one militarily. We've proved it time and time again. Uh, on the other hand, from the standpoint of economy and efficiency, at best they're a D. At best they're a D. And we need to place a lot more time and attention on getting that grade up and to freeing up billions of dollars for readiness to, to close the delta on the needs versus wants versus afford on critical weapon systems. And part of the DOD's problem is that they have so many silos and many silos and so many different systems and nobody talks to each other. Uh, that's a management problem which can affect effectiveness as well. Fortunately, it hasn't to a great extent. But Bill, I agree with you on that. Mr. Chairman, I might a add on. In the inventory area, the DOD inventory area, uh, we've uh, at GAO have had that as one of our high risk areas since 1990. Uh, there are problems in terms of keeping accurate inventories. and In some cases, this is a contributing factor to over purchasing. Uh, and uh, in order to make sure everything is on hand at time, we are working with the department to try to improve their inventory uh, taking procedures to make sure that they have accurate perpetual inventories. They have so much inventory, it's very difficult to use conventional uh, end of the year wall to wall inventory type taking techniques. So they need to improve that. The one positive thing I would say is that for the first time this past year, the uh, logistical community and the acquisition community have engaged uh, with GAO, the IGs, in uh, undertaking efforts to work with the financial management community to support and fix some of these systems. Eighty percent of all the information to prepare DOD's financial statements comes from outside the financial uh, services arena and in many cases are logistical records and some of the documentation, the support and the logistical records is not there as well. I thank you and uh, I want to wind this up now. Uh, we might send a few questions to each of you for the record and without objection they'd, the question and answer will be put in at this point. Let me first uh, thank the staff that has worked on this hearing. Uh, J. Russell George, the Staff Director, Chief Counsel for the Government Management Information Technology Subcommittee. Uh, Bonnie Heald, the Director of Communications, professional staff member. Uh, to my immediate left, the person that's had the most work on this particular subject is Larry Melanich, the detailee from the General Accounting Office. And uh, Mason Allinger, uh, the uh, Chief Clerk for our subcommittee. And then our faithful interns, Paul Wicker, Casey Baker, Richard Lucas. And for the minority, we have Faith Weiss, and Jean Gosa, uh, Faith is the counsel, uh, Jean is the chief clerk for the minority, and Early Green is staff assistant, and our two court reporters, uh, Lee Dotson and Julie Bryan. Let me just say in closing a few words. The financial story that we've portrayed over the last two hours probably is discerning, uh, disconcerting to various taxpayers in the nation, and I think we should all share with them, while progress has been made over five years, and when we passed the act in the 103rd Congress, we gave the executive branch five years to prepare for the first balance sheet in the history of the country. And well, progress is coming, but we've sure got a lot more to do, and uh, I will look to the uh, Comptroller General, the Director of the Budget, Secretary of the Treasury to work together despite two branches of the Constitution uh, being involved. And uh, I think our work's just begun in a lot of ways and we've got a long way to go. And in terms of the ongoing series of financial out, uh, oversight by this subcommittee, uh, we've already held hearings on the Internal Revenue Service, on the Federal Aviation Administration, on the Department of Justice, and on the Health Care Financing Administration. Uh, we'll be going into this with other agencies, and uh, health care financing in particular is one that concerns us just as it concerns the administration. We'd rather have all of that money uh, that uh, sometimes is overpayments or sometimes fraud, waste, and abuse in the program helping people 
uh, rather than sort of a loss to the nation. Uh, we'll continue our oversight on the financial accountability of the Department of Defense next month. We have them scheduled. And clearly, we need strong leadership in this area. And often, as we all know, financial accountability sort of wears people out and they sort of start dozing and their eyes droop and all that. But it's very important. This is the taxpayer's money, and we want to make sure it's put to good use. And I want to thank you again for coming and testifying and wish you all well. With that, we're adjourned. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good meeting. Thank you, Jeff, for coming up. I've got a one o'clock white. So when you get a cup of soup of what? Well, you get soup. What? I will do. I'm just trying to get out of the way. Just ahead on C-SPAN 2, a new report on the role of manufacturing in the 1990s economy. And later, a report on the impact of ATM surcharges. Here's a look at some weekend programming.